Hello and welcome everybody to Clayton's webinar on Skip Registration. Really round specifics of registering products. The actual registration though is actually pretty easy. So I'm gonna go over everything leading up to it and the registration. Um, it's a lot of things today. We have a little introduction and then have a little brief overview again, Skip, timelines, process. Uh, I'm gonna talk about commonly misdeclared SVHCs. This is a common problem. Uh, I do enjoy, to a certain extent, people are relying on supplier data. Uh, it's after doing, you know, hundreds or thousands of of these skip things, you definitely can see uh, it's a telephone game. It's a telephone game, but even worse understood. It's like a very garbled telephone game. So what's coming through is interesting at best, um, and how to manage that. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to manage that in practice too. We're going to talk about commonly misdeclared SVHCs to give you an understanding of where some of the supplier disconnects are coming from. And then we're going to talk about the IUCLID, the software, the different sections, creating a dossier and registration, which are two separate elements of the same software. Uh, then we're going to talk about dossier creation because it's a big part of registration. You have to create the data, data set, validate it, and then create a locked dossier version which you can export, or you can actually register directly for the system. We're gonna use the export model here. Um, then we're gonna show registration, and then of course, simplified skip notification. So the real full registration, and then the distributor aspect, the simplified skip notification, because there's a big impact on registration, because there's something you do in registration that you're gonna need afterwards. You're gonna need the skip registration number. So we're gonna talk about that and where you can get it. Um, it's only 50 minutes. I have a lot of details to go through. Uh, because of time constraints, I'm not going to do it live in IUCLID. We did it in images. Um, it's just the chance of having load issues or movement issues is, is too great. So we're doing this through um, uh, photos, uh, images, a lot more consistent. It's also a lot easier to put arrows on the screen to talk to you about what I'm talking about when I have a full uh, GUI interface in, in your face and I'm talking about one element of it. It's a lot easier with arrows. So what do we do? Uh, we do a lot, uh, laboratory testing for sure. We're basically the, the primary source for compliance for new designs in particular. Uh, it's it, Lab testing is easily the fastest, easiest way for, especially for new designs or, or new requirements. It's just the supplier, <clears throat> supply chain isn't competent enough nor, nor timely enough. And it's just faster and cheaper to test. Now we're gonna talk about Skip. Uh, doing all your legacy products, there's uh, testing itself would be great, but it's it's not really feasible over your whole legacy product portfolio. So we're going to talk about different methods, but uh, we're probably, if not the, the largest uh, restricted materials test lab in North America, definitely on the complex product side we are. It is easily the fastest, cheapest way to do compliance and most by far most effective way for new designs. Um, we also do a lot of, if you like what we do here, we do a lot of monthly and quarterly updates. We sit down with you, explain what's changed and impact you. Also, if you, depending on your knowledge bases, um, we can also do a lot of the basics. So while we're talking about the changes to the REACH SVHC list and the, what the new chemicals are or are not, to whether they're going to be in your product, we can also explain REACH SVHC in general at the same time, because people are coming in from different knowledge bases. And of course, a lot of what we're talking about today, where we're... Uh, Doing very strong in this space, um, arguably probably the most uh, common source for it now is skip web demonstrations, templates, and and product declarations. Where there you only have a couple months left. There is a better ways to do this. Um, there are faster, more efficient. Uh, ways to create accurate skip declarations, get them in the system. And so we start out and we'll explain how we do it. Um, and it's very, very effective. We do this for goodness, 50 or hundred companies now. Um, and we've learned a lot. You get to work with us. You also get to learn from what everybody else has done. You don't have to pioneer everything. Um, there's a lot of learnings. A lot of them are operational. We can talk technical to our blue in the face. I can talk chemicals, the big long names, which I'm going to do at one point today. And I talk about a chemical with a big long name or two of them. Um, but there's a lot of operational stuff, like how do you do part numbers? What has to be on there? Is it, what, it, how to handle all that? How do I handle the fact that nothing's perfect right now, or somebody may change the way they want to see it in the future. There's a way for all of it. Um, we try to structure this so it's honest, correct, accurate, meets the requirements. And when somebody may change what they like, it's not a big deal to change. So 
again, uh, time remaining. This is less than three months, less than two months now, actually. We're again really, really close, two months away now. Uh, this is, and so the, one of the reference points for a lot of people, especially North America, is the Tiger King way back when is now way back when. Uh, Timeline's less than two months. It really need a plan to solve. This is one of the big differences in Skip compared to RHS is you have to deliver. ROHS is often somebody who signs off in a back room that nobody really understands what they do, and they sign off it and sell the product. And all they see it is a yes, no. And do any two companies do ROHS the same way? Probably not. Um, this is quite different. You actually have to produce an output. Producing an output changes everything. Everybody who bought data packages suddenly, hey, wait a second, I have to create an output now as opposed to just stored data. It's a big difference. Um, and you need that output the next two months. So lots of software changes. We're going to be moving in the new software. Um, the new software got released October 27th. The registration capability appeared uh, October 28th. Um, they plan actually an update every October. That might change. Uh, new versions. Um, we're going to use the online version today, or at least shots in the online version. There's also a desktop version, which as of last week wasn't released for Macs yet, but it was released for other operating systems. Uh, we're going to use the online tool. It's also often easier to use when you have uh, multiple entities in the same company working on the same things. It, it creates a group sharing capability that's not as effective on uh, once you've downloaded your product. So we're going to talk about the new version. Uh, people ask, well, I've been in the old version. What's going to happen? They're perfectly compatible. Believe it or not, if it was validated under the old version of software and you, and you open in the new version, it will automatically change the field to the new terminology and it would pass validation. So it passed validation before, it'll pass validation now. So it's not really a big deal. Some of the terms have changed names, some to fairly nonsensical names, like working context, I'll show you that later. Uh, but it's all, anything you've been up to now is perfectly feasible in the new system. So big goals, we're a like a big fan of outputs. What's the output? Um, in this case, believe it or not, the output is not actually, the final output is not registered products. It is your skip numbers, the registration numbers for your registered products that you can provide to the next one, the distributor, the next people in the chain. The end goal is not product registration. The end goal is the skip numbers for registered products. One extra step. And there's a lot of steps in between. You see this kind of a compliance horseshoe here. You have to identify what products you need to declare what the declarable components are. Um, maybe trust your suppliers for that, good luck. Uh, they will get some of it right, and they'll get a lot of it wrong, and there'll be huge gaps. And so you need a plan to handle that, especially for legacy products. One of the things we get all the time is, from component suppliers, if you needed this, you should have asked for it before you bought it. It's actually one of the most important rules of restricted materials compliance. You're much more likely to get restricted materials data before you buy something than afterwards. Going back afterwards for something you didn't specify, you get what you get, and you don't get upset. Um, so you got to identify declarable components. Then you have to create the product and component templates. So having knowing your lead is in your lamp doesn't actually solve much. You have to know what materials the lead in. Is it in lead and brass, lead and solder? What is it in? It's lead in that material, and you have to create a component template for that lead incident of which there are multiple different types of lead instances. So knowing the from the supplier it has lead in it is actually only partially helpful. So um, you need to create product component templates. From that, and we normally do in Excel or Google Sheets because it's much easier to work in. And then we create the I6Z files in iEuclid, and then you review them. This is something people don't really take into account in there. It's We create a file, it's magically going to be good, and we're going to be happy with it. On the first ones you've ever created, that's optimistic. Um, you want to review it. You're going to say things about yourself. And whether or not you know, there's more than one way to review it. There is a PDF version of the I6Z, which is pretty helpful. But there's also report generation to know what the outside world will see. And there's safe use instructions and details about the chemicals. Are you happy with this? So what's your review process? Have you mapped this into your plan? Um, believe it or not, it is probably the single biggest stumbling block we run into time-wise, time, uh, time -wise, timeline wise, where people haven't really internalized that they're going to actually should check what they've done. And if you don't really care, then you can just rubber stamp it. But it is going to be public. Then you register, after you make any corrections from review, you register the I6Z file, which we'll talk about today. 
and then you're going to want to export the skip numbers. And you can do it manually, but there's actually an export function. I don't think we'll get to the export function today, but we'll say where it is. It's a simple button. It's simple, easy button. It's basically create Excel file, and it creates a Excel file of all your registered skip numbers that you can provide to the distributor, which is the last section, have this list of skip numbers that you can provide to a distributor or someone else in the chain that they can upload and do the simplified skip notification. So what they need for notification is an export from the system. You can make it manually, it's not that hard, it's just a list of skip numbers, but you can export directly from your system, all your registered skip numbers and their details, one file that you can provide to any distributor. So you gotta start with what products am I selling really in Europe? They're gonna have SVHCs, which for complex products is basically be all of them. And at the end, you're gonna need a list of skip numbers for registered products. So registration itself is not the end goal, it's a very, very important part of the goal, it's part of the process, um, but it, you really need the skip numbers for the registered products. So registering the products is still a couple steps from the end goal. By the way, as I go through this, um, we should have some Q&A at the end. I'm going to go a little bit quickly today, just keep, on, keep around 50 minutes. But if you have any questions, feel free to submit it in the control panel, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, if I don't get to yours, which is possible because the attendance today is, is, is uh, quite generous. Um, and there'll be lots of questions, but don't let that stop you from asking a question. I'll try to get to as many as possible. And if I don't get to yours today, just contact us. Chances are what you're asking um, has been asked by many people. One of the advantages of working for so many companies in Skip is we've seen so many of the questions so many times. We have really good answers for them. So simplified Skip notification, why is the Skip number so important? So a company will register Say it has to be a European entity, which the UK, for better or for worse, does not count as anymore. Um, it's actually a bit tricky now. The UK manufactured products have to list themselves as imported into the EU instead of EU manufactured. So imported into the EU. So anyone can make the files, by the way. The data, the data packages, the data sets can be made by anyone. You can be in Singapore or Philippines or China or the US or Europe or wherever you can create the files but it has to be submitted by an uh, EU legal entity. And so you have to create a legal entity in the system, which is pretty easy. It's mostly just address information and business number information. At that point in time, you can link anybody's user ID to it. So you, as long as you create, in this example, the legal entity in IUCLID for the French division, you could link user IDs in the US or China or wherever else, and they can use it to do the submission. It just has to be linked to a European entity. And they submit the full dossier, this data package, so it starts the data set and then gets validated and locked into a dossier in the locked version, which is technically identical to the data set. It's just locked, gets submitted to the system and you get back a skip number. A whole bunch of com complications and whether or not you have to do simple, uh, separate registration for different entities, the same company, the guidance from the ECHA does not say one way or another. Right now it's generally interpreted if you're all owned by the same parent company, you can all use the same skips. However, if you do provide it to somebody else, uh, for sure, a distributor, they have to get your skip number so they can submit it and get it back to their own uh, skip number. It's called simplified skip notification. So to do that, they need this Excel file of skip numbers, which you can export directly from the system, by the way. So you want this one, hopefully, preferably one file you can provide to any distributor. They upload it under their own legal entity. They get linked to all your data sets and dossiers. Um, and that's it. They don't have to actually know what they're doing. They just literally have to, as long as they have a legal entity, you give them an Excel file, they upload that Excel file, they're, they'll get back another Excel file, and they're all compliant. And they may or may not know what just happened, which is what we prefer. We'd rather have it. So no matter whatever their knowledge base are, if they're super knowledgeable, awesome, they know nothing, fair enough. All you do is you upload this into the system. If you do that, you're compliant. Putting much technical burden on distributors um, may have diverse outcomes. So the idea is have a simplified, simple Excel file that you export from your own system. There's a little button to do it. They upload that Excel file. They get linked to all your skip numbers. They get back their own, and everybody's compliant. So this is one of the reasons why the end output isn't registered products. It's skip numbers available to provide to someone else of your registered products. The product registration is a big part of it and a huge amount of the technical part, um, but the actual end output is the skip numbers for your registered products. Now, we're going to talk about iEuclid. It's the data system. The data system is not new for this. It's been around for 
goodness, well over a decade now. It's where they've been doing chemical registration. So if you make liquids or powders or gases and you've brought them into the EU over one ton a year, there is a system where they've had to register um, data safety information. And so this system has been around for a long time. They've adapted it now or added to it for new uses. Um, this skip notification is one of two. The other one is the poison uh, notifications, which we'll talk about in briefly in a little bit, actually. So, but when you get to the skip part, it's actually in two pieces. And the first piece has been around since April. It's the ability to create the dossier. And the dossier is really create a data set, the technical, validate it, and then you lock it into a dossier. The only difference in the data set and the dossier is locking. They are the same data. One is the working version data set, but to submit it, you have to validate it and lock it into a dossier version. So what gets submitted is the dossier. Um, the data set is perfectly malleable. You can make changes. You can revalidate it, relock it, and submit it, and you can actually up revision. Uh, but the, the dossier is what gets submitted. Um, the registration system, which is so the second system, which has registration and the SSN system, but the rest of the registration system is you can upload the dossier, and we'll show you how to do it, upload it. Um, you can actually do the upload from the top system. There's a way to do it, but we're going to show the version where you actually upload the file into the second part of the system, You how you export the SSN number, and then you're done. And the registration system, if you've done the top, the top piece is 98% of the workload, 2%, uh, the bottom part is 2%, and most of that is getting the SSN number. It is literally a drag drop operation. Registration, as long as you've done the top piece, is a drag drop operation. Really easy. But the software is only two pieces. The new stuff, as of October 28th, is the bottom half. The top half has been around since April. And even if you've done it in the old version of the software, your uh, data sets will be updated to the new version. Dossiers may not work. If you've locked them beforehand, you just have to put the, the data set in the current system, in the current version. It will update itself automatically and then relock it. So um, if you log in nowadays and you have a European entity, if you don't have a European entity, actually, you can't use the bottom ones. The bottom ones are denied access. The far right side are trial or a playground area. So you can actually do playground work on the right side without affecting anything. So there's an ECHA submission portal trial on the right, bottom right that you can play around it. Um, but it's really two pieces. It's the dossier creation side and the dossier registration side. So I'm showing you the IUC cloud. You also can have a downloadable version. Uh, the cloud is, is a little bit easier um, to work as a group. So we're going to use that one. So there's a creation section and a registration section. Remember, I had the two different lines. There's a creation section and a registration section, which also includes the simplified skip notification section. So it's two pieces, like where you create it and where you register it. Now, in the top piece, you can actually directly register it, but I'm going to treat them as two separate items right now, just a little easier to explain. So the way we do this normally uh, when we do the process is basically three phases. The first one is we establish the basics. We've done this for so many companies. One of the common truths is everybody's starting point is different. There might be similarities between other companies, but what your products are and what data you have and what information and what's the, the best way to work it are all different. Everybody starts at a different phase. There is no cookie cutter solution. If anybody tries to explain that, yeah, everybody starts the same way. No, you don't. Everybody has a different starting point. So we end up at the first phase, first explain the rules, how the templates work, the facts of product template, their component templates, how uh, part grouping works, how you do SKUs, um, how all the SVHC information and the component templates that you link to the product templates, how you do this in Excel first to do it as a working model, then how you do it in iEuclid, which is pretty darn easy if you've done the Excel version. And then, so then we take one of your products and we say, okay, what have you got? This is what you have to start with. Awesome. So we're going to do the evaluation of that product. And if you have no data, we do it through worst case scenario engineering evaluation. We have very, very experienced engineers to walk through the materials and generally do a declaration, which is better than any what the supplier's uh, data can do. And we do it in a couple of hours with you. And it's a worst case. I'm not saying it definitely has these. It's saying the materials you use normally or often enough do or reasonably likely to have 
we declare that as a worst case scenario. And as long as you declare, you're compliant. We build it off that. Now, it doesn't mean any declaration, by the way, in any early phase is not a suicide pact. And almost none of, and none of these declarations means I've done it this way. I'm stuck like this forever. No, you're not. Even, especially in this phase, you do one, you learn from it, and you say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we might not want to say this about ourselves. We're saying we have nonalphenol in our PVC. Let's go double check our one PVC part and find if it really has nonalphenol. We'll work with suppliers and we'll test it. Oh, no, it doesn't. We can remove it. You know what? We can probably group these two different desk families together or, you know, these two different uh, computers are quite different. We can separate them, create, you know, clone two different files. Lots of ways to do it. There's, it's not a suicide pact here. Even if you, by the way, if you register it, it is ridiculously easy to up revision it. Um, we know because we've had a couple of situations where somebody made a typo. Um, when a customer we're working with or ourselves, registered in the system, went, oops, there's a typo, made the correction and then resubmitted and you see the up revision version appear. It, it's really easy. Um, we're also going into two, two months away there are good, effective, honest, compliant ways to do this. National authorities might say, you know what? I really want to see part numbers like that. So you just make the part number changes next year or the year after. It's not a suicide pact. What you're doing today shouldn't be a situation where you've locked yourself in. If you locked yourself in, there's only one way to do it. Well, that's not a good plan. Um, you know, even ECHA hasn't done enough of these. Uh, they're still learning. So we do a one, so we create a file for one of your products. We do it all the way to the basically registration step. Once we figured out from where you start to how to get to the output, so everybody's starting point is different, but everybody's ending point has to be the same. So first step is we show you how to do it. And we do one for you. We actually take one of your products and it's about two hours, two and a half hours. Um, we walk through everything, the basics, the explanation, the process, the templates, and, and value one of your products and do it with you. You're going to learn a lot about your products. The the people we have, since we have our own test lab, our knowledge base on material is quite significant. Um, and anybody you're dealing with has done dozens of these, if not more. And in some cases, literally the SVHC reviews hundreds. And we're going to do an evaluation. We're also going to, if you have supplier data, we will combine it. But we're not dependent whether you have supplier data or not. Worst case a scenario evaluation is is really reasonable. And we find supplier data is more likely than not to have mistakes. This is the telephone game on roids. Uh, yeah, so this is like telephone game trying to do voice over dial up. It's very exciting. So one of the common ones we get all the time is realize a lot of your suppliers, what they're doing is the telephone game. And so they're looking at a safety data sheet and saying, hey, it's in the safety data sheet. Therefore, it's in your final product. Not necessarily true whatsoever. And using homogenous material rules for RHS doesn't work either. Most of the SVHCs, not all of them, are reactive. And that's how they ended up with some negative outcome, carcinogen, reproductive toxin, whatever, they're reactive. Generally, things that are reactive are not very pleasant in your product. You don't want your product having weird reactions all the time or changing forms. So generally, a lot of the SVHCs, when they're in your product, are in a reacted form. They've reacted with something, so they stop reacting. If your plastic on your outer shell, whenever somebody, you know, got wet, you know, dissolved, it wouldn't go so hot. You know, if you had a computer with a water soluble, not don't put water in your computer, by the way, water soluble outer enclosure, it would not go well. So a lot of them are reactives. They're salts and, and hydrides and all that kind of stuff. And they're in the safety data sheet, but they're not in the final version. One of the most common is MHHPA, hexahydromethyl phthalic anhydride. Why the M ends up on the front in the acronym or not, I don't know. It's really four variations. Um, the only thing difference between them is the methyl group, the CH3. Sorry to do chemistry, I apologize. Some of us all hope we left this a uh, long, long time ago in the dust in high school. Um, some unfortunate, some folks like myself, uh, it hasn't gone away. Uh, the methyl group is a CH3. Depending on what part of that hexagon it's on, it changes the name. One spot, one, two, three, and four. Um, it's on spot two right now, the second spot. And it's all basically very similar chemistry. It's just all where the CH3 is attached. So it's really four chemicals, commonly called MHHPA, as reported by supplier in the safety data sheet, it can be any one or all of these. So it's commonly reported. Is it in your final product? Nope. So MHHPA is a hardener. It's uh, mostly for uh, the glycerol ether uh, bisphenol A ethers. By the way, bisphenol A is an SVHC also. 
Um, what it is, is MHHPA, in its normal form, it's basically like it's holding its hands together. So if you look on the left side of MHHPA, I should have put arrows here, but MHHPA on the left side, you see this one oxygen in the middle. It's like it's holding hands with itself. It's like it's praying. It's got those double bond oxygen sitting off the side, but the one oxygen on the far left, it's like it's holding hands. And the way it works is a hardener, when it reacts with the, the diglyceryl ether, uh, BPA combo, it stops holding its own hands and the bond breaks and reaches out and holds hands with two epoxy polymers. And it binds them together. It's not a catalyst. It attaches them together. It attaches the two uh, epoxy molecules together. And that's how it hardens it. By taking the smaller chains and connecting them together to make longer chains, that hardens the chemical. It's a reaction. It's now no longer MHHPA. It is a much more complicated chemical. Same thing with bisphenol A. When bisphenol A becomes polycarbonate, there's only a tiny bit of BPA left over. Um, the BPA reacts to the FOS gene and gets terminated by the terpetal phenol, which is an SPHD also. But it's no longer BPA. It's polycarbonate. We test for BPA in it. We only get this tiny residual amount. The rest is all bonded. It's a different chemical. So MHHPA will be in the safety data sheet of a lot of uh, epoxy sealants, especially in LEDs. It's not in the final product. It's them. It's the supplier reading or some supplier down the chain in the telephone game reading the safety data sheet. MHHPA is the hardener and diglyceryl ether BPA epoxies, amongst others, um, but it fully reacts in the final version. Uh, another one commonly misdisclared, especially in industrial products, TGIC. It is the hardener for carboxyl polyester resins, uh, powder coats. And so in the powder coat, it'll be in the, it'll be quite a few percent actually in the powder coat, but it's a hardener and it does the same thing. It's this complicated, bizarre molecule. When it's sprayed on, it reacts with the polyester resins and creates these longer chains. So it takes smaller chain polyester resins, small ones, attach them together to make larger ones. The larger ones are more rigid, harder, and that's how it works as a hardener. So the TGIC generally fully reacts. It's not a catalyst. It becomes a new chemical. When you're polycoating, uh, you, you got a, a liquid often or a spray, and it becomes a solid. There's a chemical reaction going on, and that's TGIC. The second part of it, if you look in the guidance and coded articles, is the declarable levels at the article. The article is the first time you no longer require a safety data sheet. So if you have two pieces on a hockey stick and you adhere them together, say with that MHHPA, based epoxy, any residual MHHPA, which is tiny to begin with, is measured over the weight of the two things it's adhered to because it's got a safety data sheet. It's a chemical until uh, part A, article A and article B are adhered together. And then anything residual in that little joint, right, epoxy, is measured over the weight of, of the, the adhesive and the two components it's attached together. If you potted, say, in a power supply, it's measured over the whole weight of the power supply you just potted it into. It's the first time it's no longer requires a safety data sheet. This gets even more so with uh, paint. So if you coat it on, even though it's TGIC residual potentially, but well below 1,000 ppm even in the coating, any residual TGIC is measured over the weight of the coated component. Um, because it has a safety data sheet until the, the, the powder coating is powder coated on. And at that point in time, it's only whatever residual TGIC is in over the weight of the entire coated component, metal, paint, and all. So generally not declarable. But if you look at the safety data sheet for the, the, the powder coating, it could be like three or 4%. But that, and that's what's being reported to you in the telephone game that such is SVHC data gathering from suppliers, um, but it's not declarable in your product. Pretty common problems. Um, we handle all of these. Depending, and so if you have no supplier data, there's a plan. If you have some supplier data, there's a plan. If you have lots of supplier data, there's a plan. If it's in all different ways and methods, we're used to that. Everybody's starting system is different. People say, hey, well, our data system's in enter software name here. Tons of different ones out there. Or we have no data. Or this is all we have. Or this is what we're making. There's a plan for all of them. So in phase one, one of the big steps is determining doing the declaration, determining how you're going to do it for your product, what's going to get you compliant skip declarations by January. And then we can do it for you. Once the process is established, all the templates are in place. It's a set piece battle. You just follow the process to create the declaration. Uh, everybody's starting point is different. Everybody's end point has to basically be the same. I'm just quibbling about terminology at that point in time. 
So we can do at that point on all your product lines. Once you've, you've established, once we establish with you, what's the best way for you? And that process has similarities from company to company, but there is a lot of variation. What's the best way for you? And then we create all the files. And the last phase is registering. We want to register, which is really easy, and then collect your SSN. Believe it or not, uh, one of your hardest parts is actually going to often be reviewing the files before submitting. Basically, are you ready to rubber stamp them to register? Registration is not going to be hard. Are you comfortable with what's in it? Do you understand it well enough? Or if you don't really care, then it doesn't really matter. So, of course, we focus a lot on the compliance horseshoe here for Skip. We're basically, what do I have? What's my selling to Europe with declarables in it? At the end of the day, I need a list of skip numbers of registered products with a whole bunch of steps in between. So we're going to go back to the registration part. We've talked about before. I talked about a lot right now, the first half of the horseshoe. Let's talk about the registration side. Now, the registration side, again, I talked about IU clays, two pieces, creating the dossier and registering the dossier. And yes, we can get to technicalities. There's a field, there's a ability in the creation side to actually submit it automatically to the registration side. But I'm going to treat them as separate because it's going to be easier to explain here. So we're going to talk about dossier creation, which we have talked about to a certain extent up until now. So imagine I invented, we invented a consumer laptop, whether a typical laptop has these things, they're not, they're super common components. Um, what you have to do. So if you create the data set, it's easy to create for you and figure out what you're going to use for naming conventions. Um, it has to, for consumer products, it has to be something on the product. It doesn't necessarily mean it's all one thing. It could be UBC code, could be SKU. A lot of people have regulatory numbers or other numbers on their product. This is really common for consumer products that have different variations for each country or different colors. They usually have a regulatory model, which is closer, more linked to their electrical safety than it is to that specific SKU. As long as it's on the product, that counts for the consumer. A professional products have even a little more leeway. This has to be something that can be honestly described the product. So there's a new, or there's a field that's changing names. So before you lock it, everything we create up until now, what we talked about in the horseshoe is you create a data set. So if you create it with these declarable components, the button cell batteries, aluminum components, the high temp solder, the brass component, the steel component, which has respectively EGDME, lead, 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 and lead, Things you can't just put all leads together because you have to identify the materials code, which aluminum is a different materials code than brass, which is different than steel, which is different than solder. Um, so once you've, you've created the data set and reviewed it, you need to lock it into a dossier. So as I mentioned earlier, the data set's the working version. The submitted version is the locked version. When you lock it, it creates a new copy. It doesn't affect the original data set. You can still play with the original data set. To lock it, you actually have to do a non-intuitive thing. Where it says working context, which is also very unhelpful language, which has changed since the previous revision, is there is a pull down menu. There's only one choice in that pull down menu. You have to pick skip notification. It's a remnants of chemical uh, registration, which have more than one option. It just has skip notification. You have to pull that one down. If you don't do it, nothing works. Um, so you can create the data set, but you can't register until you hit that pull down and turn it into skip notification. Uh, I've got a thing on my screen. I'm just going to move around. I can't quite see. Um, so validation, then you have to validate it. We'll get to that in a section. Okay, so if you go out to the main page, you'll notice there's two different, if you have a list of all your products in the system, you notice two different versions. There's a data set version and a dossier version. Um, you have to click them to see each other. You can't see the data sets and the dossiers at the same time. They're, by the way, format-wise identical. One is just the unlock data set, unlock, dossier locked. And when you lock it, the data set still exists. So you, when you lock a data set, it doesn't, it creates a locked copy. It doesn't actually lock the main data set. You can still modify it. This is also built on revision. So the idea is if you then change your data set again, relock it, you can have revision. So this is the working version, the data set. So on the data set, which is the working version, after you choose skip notification, you have you choose validation. You have to validate it and see if there's any errors. If you've done it properly, that shouldn't be, um, but it also checks all the components too. Each component has their own full IU grid itself. So you got to validate it. And then uh, you lock it. So you lock file for registration. So it's 
choose your working context, validate it, and then lock it. When you lock it, there'll be a number of, of optional fields in terms of do you want to write any new titles and details like that, but it's mostly titling. So it's basically working context, you only have one choice, validate, lock it. When you lock it, it's going to have some new stuff. It's going to have the ability to export it. And that's the ISIG Z. That is the file you register. That export to ISIG Z is the file you register. There's another way in the system, which I can show you the way I'm set up right now, that you can submit it directly. Um, but easiest one to do is you export it. Because anybody can create these. And as long as you have a link to a legal entity, you can do the registration. But we're going to treat them as two different systems because they basically are. So you export the ISIG Z. The I6Z file of the dossier, the locked version, is what gets registered. The data set is not registrable. It's not locked. If you want to know what it looks like, you can generate a report. And a report is more what the outside world looks like. When you generate a report, you have two different options. The top one, if you haven't done any sense of information, which is tricky to do, um, but if it the top one is what it looks like to the outside world. So if you want to see what it looks like to the outside world, skip notification preview report. So that's what it looks like to the outside world. Generate report. And it's got a PDF. It's fully linked. It's, um, it's got a beautiful skip thing on the front. Um, all It has all the different sections that are linked. This is a preview of really what it's going to look like in the system. This is the of the dossier. The PDF itself is not submitted in the system. This is for your viewing. The preview file. So the locked version has a preview file. The data set has a different preview file with more detail in it. This is uh, closer to what the final version is going to look like. So you need to create the data set, the work, and then you need to validate it and lock it as a dossier before you register it. When you go in registration, the system has a lot of different options. The one on the left is very interesting. So again, we're in dossier registration. So the submission portal has a lot of fields, and we'll get to that. So the second where, part is where you do dossier registration down at the bottom. Um, when you do it, before we get into the, the actual registration, the left side is the CLP poison centers. This is not related to SKIP. There are two different notifications in here. If you make liquid chemical, liquid gas powders, chemicals with safety data sheets, believe it or not, depending on what the product is, how new it is, et cetera, you're going to have to register basically the hazard information, SDS, into the system. You know, a lot of safety data sheets these days say at the top, you know, in, in the case of exposure or whichever, contact Chemtrek. Um, EU is like, that doesn't work very well. So the EU is putting, you have to put all basic SDS. It's not quite that simple. Basically, it's a subset of SDS in this system. So consumer products, a new consumer product, have to do it right now. Uh, if you make professional reagents and stuff like that, you're going to have to go through the left side. That's for chemicals. Basically, more or less, all of your SDSs are going to end up in here. It's a subset of your SDS. It's for basically as an exposure. The EU wants anybody to be able to look up in the system um, immediately on what the hazards are and what they can do. So instead of worrying about trying to find the safety data sheet and then phone chemtrack, it's all going to be here. It's going to be listed in one spot. And your registration number is going to have to be in your product label. And there's a variety of rules around that. So that's the left side. It's a whole different topic for another time. It's the chemical side. It's basically the SDS registration side. It's not quite SDS registration, but it's a good way to explain it. The middle one is the skip side. And we're going to talk about registrate. So now we're going to go through the complex process of registering. You've created the data set. You've locked it. You got a dossier. Now we're going to go through the really, 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 really complicated part of registration. You drag drop it here. That's it. And uh, often people are like, well, we need you know, to hire somebody to do registration. No, no. All the rest up until now, yes. We will, honest to goodness, web meeting with you to do this, um, but it's drag drop. The registration itself is not hard. You got to lock the dossier. Registration is drag drop it in. You can actually also do it directly from the, the dossier system, just a little more, uh, not quite as obvious. But this is the sum and total. You've exported that I6Z, you drag it in here and you let it go. Or you upload a whole bunch from your computer. That's registration. Now, don't forget the SSN part, because you still need, the registration is not the hard part. It's the simplified skip notification where the next person in line needs the skip numbers. Again, remember, 
the end goal is not product registration. It's a list of skip numbers of your registered products. They need to be able to do this and they can make it super painful themselves down at the bottom where you can uh, load one skip number in at a time, which they've copy paste, which is incredibly sensical, 30 or 40 alphanumeric, 9, 4, 6, 8, 3, F, 5. It just rolls off the tongue. Um, you can do it manually or you can upload an Excel file of skip numbers and you can get this directly from the system. Uh, I didn't know how time was going to work, so I didn't include that today. But inside this, the third one down, is search for skip notifications. So second one is, is do the skip notification, which I'll show again in a section. Third one is search for skip notifications. The third one down, there is an export field where you can export all of the skip numbers in a single Excel file. If you give that to it, that you've registered, if you give that to a distributor, they can just upload it in the system and they automatically qualifies for their SSA. So it's a simple one button export. I wasn't sure about timing, so I didn't put the, the image of that one in here today. But again, this simplified skip notification, as long as if you create that file, all they do is upload it in here. So if you're distributing somebody else's product, it's the same thing. But for your products, you can export from that search area, a Excel file that has all your skip numbers. You give it to them, they upload it, and they automatically register all your skip numbers under their name also, under the SSN. And they get their own skip numbers, and they're all wonderfully compliant. So you try to make it as simple as giving them the one Excel file they upload in the top and everybody's compliant. In a perfect world, this one Excel file you can provide to any requester. So you don't have to worry about tailoring and say, I need your SSN. And they give you all these details and all these different parts. And you're going, here's my file, just upload it. We're good. Try to make it simpler like Conflict Minerals. For all of its challenges, it's usually one file. Somebody asks, you give them the file, they upload it or use it, and everybody's happy. Um, so same thing here. The idea is to create one export Excel file. If anybody asks, you just give them the file, they upload it, and everybody's happy. And every, not everybody involved even has to know what they just did, which we prefer being more idiot proof. Now, as my mother would say, the, the world often finds a, a way to create an even better idiot, but um, this at least tries to cut down on the number of problem situations. So again, remember the process, what products you're selling, identify the declarable components, create the product component templates, uh, create the I6Z files, review them. Don't forget that in your timeline. It's If you don't plan that in, you'd be amazed how it becomes a stumbling block. Because you say, okay, I've created them. Are you happy with them? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so at what point in time are you ready to prove them? If you don't really care what's in them, eh, it's pretty easy approval. Um, you register in the system, which is that complicated drag drop product process. You drag it in, it registers. Export your skip numbers. Normally by pushing a single button, it exports the skip numbers in Excel file of everything you've registered. And then you have a list of skip numbers for your registered product, which is the real goal. Um, so a lot going on a bit quickly today. A little ahead of schedule, not a tiny bit. Remember, uh, what do we need? Can you help? Laboratory testing. This is really good. You basically have a product and saying, hey, I have to be compliant to all these different things. We never ask the suppliers for this as part of the design. What do I do? Well, we can just do the testing in a couple of weeks, have the compliance for everything, the declarations for everything. It's it's phenomenal, especially for new products. I want to sell this globally or I want to sell an EU market. I just reach SVHC is one of many things. There's pop and reach restrictions and RHS and all these other wonderful things. We um, we can take care of it all one pop. Or say, hey, wait a minute, we might add you guys, these guys actually might know things. Our monthly and quarterly updates are really popular. We sit down and say, hey, this is what's changed. Hey, there are two new chemicals up to become SVHCs in December. This is why they are or are not likely to be in your product. Here's the new US, we'll say PFAS, the real name is a bit complicated, restriction for waterproof coatings. This is one of the first, it's really a government notification, but we'll call it a restriction um, on PFAS and waterproof coatings. It's one of the first chemical and article restrictions we're seeing under the new Tosca. And how does that work? And what are people really enforcing for in Prop 65? And how does that affect me? And always coming back to how does that affect me? And of course, talking about skip, two months left. Do you have a plan? If not, we can help. And even just do this demonstration section that you say, hey, wait a minute, I think I can manage this. Do the first one. You're going to learn a lot. You get to benefit from everybody else's knowledge. You get the templates. We'll create a file from one of your products. It's really straightforward. It, one of the big plans out of not only get you up to speed is saying, hey, this is what you have or do not have for data and product information, all these kind of things, compliance. Everybody starts a different spot. 
everybody's data set's different. Even if they're trying to collect supplier data or have collected supplier data, their data sets are actually quite different. How they've managed it, how it's gone in their system, everybody's different. And then what's the best way to get to the same output at the end? And so we build that in. So again, phase one, strongly recommend. It's great. You'll learn a lot. Sometimes we'll talk chemicals like MHHPA, and I hope it didn't lose too many people on that part. Um, but we'll do the expedition process, the product template, we get the component templates. We'll build an IU, we'll evaluate one of your products, create an IUCLID file from what you have. A lot of it will be a visual review. Worst case scenario review of the materials, but we'll also use whatever supplier data you have and explain how to make use of it, what you can and can't do with it, how to create solution paths for everything. And then from that, once the process is established, we can do them all for you. If you're at point in time comp will do it yourself, you have the full process and template, but we can do them all for you. It's pretty straightforward. Once the process is down, how do we get from where you start to the common endpoint? We can do them all. And then registering, we can, of course, help you submit your products, but you're going to want to submit it yourself. You're going to want to be able to control it in your own data and your own ID or password long term. Um, but it's pretty easy. It's a drag drop operation. And we'll show you what buttons to push to export uh, skip numbers. It's pretty simple. So I'm very slightly ahead. Probably had room to do, add in the um, uh, export the skip numbers. But if you have any questions, please feel free to submit in the control panel and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Oh, I've had some audio quality problems. I apologize. Um, there will be a recording. For, so a couple questions. Everybody who registered, uh, not just the tenant registered, will receive a copy of the slides. We will have a recording of this available online um, probably in the next couple of days. Uh, it's also be in YouTube, so you can slow me down, which seems to be popular. Um, but there will be a youtube version and we'll send it out uh link to the recording uh, available probably in the next couple of days good first question is the intention skip to identify components for recycling what's the legal intention what's the real intention it's a good question so um the legal intention is under the waste framework directive that so the waste processors recyclers when they recycle a product, have an idea of what dangers or hazards are in it for purposes of protecting their own workers and landfill and air and a variety of other reasons. Um, will they be interested in individual product at a time? Rarely, it's not worth their time or effort. Where it's more useful is in a different uh, level. One of the reasons why you put in customs code, that gives them a lot more information. What they're gonna be more interested in is the aggregate of risks saying, when I'm doing electronics or medical devices, what are the risk substances that I have to manage? I don't wanna know on individual product basis, I wanna know, I process these types of products, what are the hazards that I have to be aware of my worker, workers or uh, disposal in landfill or, or other, or recycling? What are the hazards I'm likely to see? That's how they're more likely gonna use it as waste providers. However, in reality, one of the main use for is for the European Chemical Agency and the authorities to have a database of where restricted substances are at a customs code level to identify of where to put their efforts towards further restrictions, whether under ROHS or REACH. Right now, if you look at the substances being reviewed to be added to ROHS, they're completely based on the chemical registrations, which are liquids and powders and gases. And as I mentioned earlier, is a lot of dangerous substances are reactive. And in the final version, they're reacted and they're not present anymore. So they keep running situations like, hey, let's look at banning nickel chloride. Well, nickel chlorides use a nickel electron plating bath, but the end product is pleated nickel, no nickel chloride left over. What they'll use here instead is they'll have better ideas saying, you know what? When we're looking at electronics, these are the substances we need to spend effort on. Which ones should we spend the effort on? So it is basically giving them an inventory of hazardous chemicals in physical products. That is one of the most fundamental uses. And the last one, the public aspect, it gives consumers or professionals uh, visibility into what's in a product. So this will be public. Um, certain parts are reacted out. 
but they'll be able to look at your product and identify what restricted materials are on it, whether they do it as an individual decision base of an individual buyer or non-governmental organizations do data aggregation to identify what hazardous substances are in uh, different products. So that's its real use. It Legally, it's for waste providers to specifically identify what's hazardous in a specific product. They're more likely to use it as an aggregated product family and say, what kind of risk do I have to worry about? I have to worry about lead and I have to worry about um, siloxane. What do I actually have to worry about? <laughs> I'm struggling to open my I6Z files after export. Uh, what does that happen to you? Yeah, well, the I6Z files are not, are, um, let's say locked. They're not made to be opened without specialized software. If you want to open it, you'll you won't be able to put it back together. Change the .isigz to .zip, and you'll be able to open it. It's a zip file of a tremendous amount of XML and a bunch of other stuff. It won't be that useful, and you won't be able to put it back together again. But if you change it to .zip, you can actually open it up. What you want to do instead is when you export the .isigz down about two or three lines, is the ability to export PDF. The PDF is what um, you would normally use to review it. So when we export a file for somebody, we give them the I6Z and the PDF version. PDF version is no regulatory use. It just gives uh, normal folks the ability to read what's in it. So the I6Z, you can open it by actually changing I6Z to .zip, but you won't be able to put it back together again, and it won't make as much sense. What we normally do is we output the .i6 and the, dot, um, the PDF together. Do you have info on how to register Skip in a way to cover multiple brand options? Yes. Uh, talk to us. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, it has to be honest. Um, it has to reflect something. If it's a, a consumer number written on the product and how to manage that, and you can put multiples together. I mean, in many cases, if you made a coffee machine, you probably make a variety of different colors and some different variations, and but they're all the same declarable. So. There's a lot you can do from product family, especially the short time frame. It, it's a little dependent on what it is. Normally, it has to be able to be described by the same title, have the same customs codes, there's some options there, but have the same customs code, have the same declarables, or have the same worst case scenario declarables. What you declare there declares the worst case in the family. And then you have to be able to describe or list the products in scope. So as long as you can do that, um, you can normally group them together. How do you link daughter companies, legal entities to the main account? Um, normally create a legal entity and we link user IDs. In terms of linking similar companies, I'd have to ask our specialist on that. What we normally have is a legal entity that we, inside the legal entity account, you can add new user IDs to use it. If we pass the skip numbers to dealers, but they do nothing with it, is it our responsibility? Uh, not directly, no. It, it is the distributor's responsibility to be registered. Otherwise, they're not allowed to sell the product. You have the indirect effect that they can't sell your product all of a sudden because they're not doing something they're supposed to do, but it's the distributor's responsibility. Can the same person on one member state be the same person in another member state? Yes. So funnily enough, uh, we have a couple different uh, legal entities, and my user ID, I can actually flip between them. So you can actually connect your user ID to multiple legal entities and flip between them. Um, there's a lot of pushback about product grouping. It's actually in the guidance, um, how you do it. It's perfectly allowed as long as you stay within the rules. There is a variety of, and so what we want to do is, we're also a big fan of, of hanging together so they hang separately. If you be wrong, be wrong in good company. And uh, what we do is what's done by uh, 50, 100 companies, if not a lot more. It meets all the requirements. It's in the guidance under worst case scenario. There's this grouping of similar components. And the thing is, you do it one particular way. Again, it's not a suicide pack. And you get pushback from a legal authority and saying, okay, then you define exactly what you need. Oh, that's what you need. And then you can have provision. This is, it's not, like we're stuck like this for the rest of our lives is ECA doesn't even know what they're doing. And um, we find if people try to do things at the part level, now there's huge gaps and, and it won't make the deadline. Um, it's very untruthful. The key thing is to be honest and truthful. And so product grouping, we get 
it's extremely common. I think it's probably the most common way to be successful. Uh, people are doing trying to create one declaration per SKU aren't going so well right now. Um, that's a good question for you. I understand Eka said that flow solder used circuit board manufacturer has to be considered as an article. Uh, Eka, A, does not make any guidance, does not make any definitional decisions. They do not. They can make a variety of different commentary, but they don't make any. And they say that right in there, they will not make, because they are legally not allowed to make any recommendations on what is an article. That is a legal term in an EU legislation, and that is solely the purview of the text of the legislation and the, and the European Court of Justice. They have no ability to define what an article is. Um, what If you want to be really specific, an article is the first time in which a material no longer requires a safety data sheet. If your solder requires a safety data sheet up until the point where it's applied, any SVHC left in the solder is measured over the weight of whatever it's applied on. It's that simple. If it's still got a safety data sheet, it is a chemical and not an article until it reaches the point um, when it's applied. And then it's measured over a weight of whatever it's applied to. Uh, can a file be uploaded to uh, iUclid as opposed to uploading the web uh, desktop version? Um, the web and desktop version uh, are, are iUclid. So the web version is iUclid, the desktop version are both iUclid. So it is either one of them works. The desktop version will have to connect to it, obviously. If you're not connected to the internet, it won't work. But other than that, both of them work. Uh, I was told that Echo is now requesting more granularity in data sets to every different material is listed, um, which is what you're often doing with grouping. There's a whole section on how to do it. You can't sit there and put different materials codes together. So when we do component grouping, they meet all the requirements. The name is, is as it described, counts all of them. They are the same as VHC, they're the same tariff code, and they're the same materials code. And that's the key one. So that's why you can't put leaded brass and leaded aluminum together. They're, the aluminum brass are different materials codes. So it has that level of granularity. There's also a wonderful argument. If you put a part number in, yeah, this is a, uh, the 577 flange or 577 part, it means nothing to the waste provider. You say brass component, that means something. So the way you describe it, um, you also have to look at how it'll be used. So if the way you've described it is as accurate or more accurate than other ways, it meets the requirements. And again, like anything else, you know, they might come out with something else next year. Right? Honest to goodness, you know what's going to happen? ECA has a Twitter account. The key goal for them is they're going to publicize how many companies and how many products are in the system. They are extremely motivated because they have to justify their budget. And if nobody registers, their budget is not justified to say people have registered. Sure, in year one or two, they might make different recommendations for change, but it's actually not their purview. That's actually the national authorities, believe it or not. Um, they're going to be super motivated to say, hey, I have this many companies in the system, and they're going to tweet it. Their Twitter account's quite aggressive. Um, that's their main motivation. If I have FMD details of part component, can I fill in skip details of articles without connecting with the supplier? Uh, full material declarations are unfortunately um, – the veracity is weak at best, but if you believe you have enough data in them to make declarations, yes, you can create. We normally don't bother with the supplier information um, in terms of what they 100% say it is because what they're going to say to do for one leaded brass part and what somebody else says are going to be totally different, and it's your product. So it is normal to create your own product templates for any information, whether it's supplier data, if you believe the full material declaration. However, unfortunately, most skip substances are buried inside other chemical declarations and don't necessarily appear in FMD. Oh, we got an error message trying to export to an I6Z file. How can we troubleshoot the error? I don't know, actually, I've never had that. That's an interesting problem. That's a question for the um, Skip help desk. Uh, they have an IT help desk. I can't remember the exact email, but there's a help desk on the website that's up in their uh, purview. It depends if you're the online version. I use that primarily. Uh, it might be a little bit different if it's the uh, the download version. What do you mean by product and component templates? So believe it or not, when your supplier says, hey, I have lead in this part, you're going, great. That doesn't help, actually. Well, it tells you have lead. It means you have to do something. But you actually have to create a component template for that. You can't declare lead in the laptop. It has to be at the component level. So you can declare lead in the brass component. 
So you need one for the product level, the laptop, which has lead or brass components, lead aluminum, lead steel, uh, uh, EGDME in the coin cell. And then you need one for the lead and brass part, which has the materials code and the information for the brass part of the brass part family. Um, and so you need, so whenever you get it declared SBHC, it needs its own IUCLA declaration. It's got its own family to put in there. You have to put its name, its uh, customs code, its materials code, it's lead, um, your SVHC range, the safe use instructions, all of that have to go in. When you, when somebody says, hey, I have lead here, you have to do all of those other eight or 10 fields also. So we create component templates, which are basically the same thing over and over again. It's when you run into a lead and brass situation, you use this template. So the idea is whenever you get something declared by a supplier or for your own evaluation or testing, each declarable has a solution path. Some like MHHPA are, non are not declared because they're not in the final product. Some like lead, you have to determine this is lead and brass. If so, then this is the solution path and it's the template you use. I have a great one. Somebody asked me, if they, have a, they said they have a question. Awesome. I just go scroll down and find out where that is. What happens when a new SVHC is announced after, uh, which affects existing products? Legally, the day after you're supposed to have updated your skip file. <laughs> Anywho. Um, in, in past history, the enforcement has been delayed by a year. So it's up to national authorities. ECHA can't say anything about enforcement. It's not under their purview. Um, enforcement for what's in here is actually national, uh, national authority. It is not the responsibility of the um, uh, ECHA. So we're supposed to be done the next day. In reality, uh, there's about a year's grace in practice. Now that could change. Um, if they want to enforce the day after and everybody, well, they're going to enforce everybody. The supply chain is not ready for it. The way we approach it is leading up to it, we identify whether the SVHC can even be in your product. If so, what is the plan if it comes on the list? Sometimes the plan is we've already justified why there's no way that could be in your product above point one. Sometimes it's like, you know what? It's just a silicone. If we can't figure this out in a reasonable amount of time, we can just declare the siloxanes in them. So legally, Theoretically, ECHA can't say otherwise because enforcement's not. It's the day after a skip list comes out. In practice, it's generally a year for enforcement. When you do, if you do make an update, um, it's very simple to do a revision. It just does a revision update. Is it mandatory of legal entity the EU to create skip dossiers? Anyone can create the data set, anyone can create the dossiers. To register it, it has to be attached to EU, the EU legal entity. Um, oh, here's the last, last question. Sorry, I'm running out of time. I didn't get to everybody's questions or the other last 20 or 30. Apologize. Just contact us and we'll try to get to it. Are we creating the skip number for material level components or for complex objects? The skip number is normally only the complex number, a complex object, so at the laptop level. However, it will have a skip number. However, it'll have embedded components into it. It'll have the lead of brass, lead of steel, lead of aluminum, uh, EG Demi in the components embedded in it. Um, so they won't have their own skip number. They'll be embedded in it. They have their own whole IUCLID uh, uh, declaration, but it's embedded. You can link to someone else's, but if you create your own, it's just embedded with one skip number at the laptop, which is a common way to do it. So I apologize. I didn't get to everybody's uh, setup. Um, thanks much Lee, for attending. Everybody's questions, sorry. Um, I'm running a little bit over time. If you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me. and We'll try to get to as many as possible. If you need help, we do lots of this. And remember, everybody has a different starting spot and you want to get to a common output. And this is not a suicide pact. The idea is to meet the compliance requirements by January 5th and then be in a situation that if somebody doesn't like one piece or another, you can have a reasonable solution path saying, you're compliant. If you really, you can argue about how you want us to split our products up. If that's how you really want to split our products up, sure, that's a year two project. Uh, but year one, January 5th, we want to be compliant to the requirements. Thanks much for attending. And again, everybody who register, receive a copy of the, the slides and we should have a recording of this up in the next couple of days. Thanks again. And look forward to hearing, talk to everyone soon.